Good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome you all to our 11th annual Rosencrantz debate. I want to express our gratitude to the Rosencrantz Foundation for supporting this event for the last decade. We love having this Saturday centerpiece for our convention, an intellectually sharp one-on-one -on -one debate between two, two highly prominent legal theorists. It's been quite a distinguished career, which had a wonderful start in 2008 with a discussion between judges Richard Posner and Mike McConnell, then judges Guido Calabresi and Frank Easterbrook. In 2010, professors Richard Epstein and William Eskridge. In 2011, Paul Clement and Larry Tribe debated health care. In 2012, we had Judge Kaczynski and Hadley Arkes. In 2013, Randy Barnett and Judge Wilkinson. In 2014, former Attorney General McCasey debated Nadine Strawson. In 2015, Robbie George and John McGinnis debated the Constitution was made for a moral and religious people and is indeed suited for the government of no other. In 2016, we had Eugene Volokh, Professors Eugene Volokh and Deborah Rohde, and last year, Randy Barnett and Akhil Lamar debated. To moderate this year's debate and introduce our speakers, I want to call on Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy, Beth Williams, who's long been involved with the Federalist Society. Beth? Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jean, for that introduction, and thank you all for the warm welcome. I also want to thank Jean, Leonard, Dean, and the team at the Federalist Society for putting on a characteristically fantastic conference these past few days. And thank you, of course, to Professor Nick Rosencrantz for starting and continuing the wonderful tradition of this debate, which follows in the best tradition of the Federalist Society of exploring opposing views on timely and important legal topics. I'm honored to be here today to moderate today's Rosencrantz debate, which will take on a very timely and important topic, whether lower courts have the authority to enter universal injunctions. Before I introduce our debaters, I'll take a few minutes to set the stage. Universal injunctions are injunctions that grant relief to parties outside the case and outside of the class action framework. One question that recurs has been, what do we call them? Many have called them nationwide injunctions, but that name is not really appropriate because it's not the geographic scope that defines them. Their defining characteristic is who gets the relief afforded. Is it just the parties to the case or are parties beyond the case granted relief by the court. So we've thrown around various names for them, limitless injunctions, non-party injunctions. Justice Gorsuch recently at oral argument suggested they could be called cosmic injunctions. Uh, and of course, at the Department of Justice, we call them every other Friday injunctions. <laughs> But regardless of what they're called, the entry of universal injunctions is a relatively recent phenomenon. Universal injunctions did not exist before even 60 years ago. Before 1963, no court in this country had issued such an injunction, and they were very rare until President Reagan took office. Even after that, by Department of Justice estimates, courts issued an average of only 1.5 universal injunctions per year against the Reagan Clinton and George W. Bush administrations, and 2.5 per year against the Obama administration. In President Trump's first year in office, however, judges issued a whopping 20 universal injunctions, an eightfold increase over the last administration. This matches the entire eight-year total of such injunctions issued against President Obama during his two terms. We are now at 27. Whatever you might think about the merits of universal injunctions, the sharp increase in their frequency is remarkable. Uh, in full disclosure, the Justice Department's position on this is not a secret. Uh, over the years, uh, the department, ha including under President Obama, has taken a consistent position on them. And my office, the Office of Legal Policy, has had the opportunity to, develop, to delve deeply into the issue. In fact, earlier this fall, Attorney General Sessions issued litigation guidelines for Department of Justice attorneys involved in litigation that challenges a federal government program, regulation, order, or law. 
But uh, I know this is making news. Not everyone agrees with the Department of Justice. Some question whether the judiciary can really be an effective check on presidential power and unconstitutional statutes if lower courts do not have the power to strike down unlawful actions immediately and universally. Many people on both sides of the aisle believe that lower courts must have this power in order to best preserve liberty. I'm happy to be in the moderator's chair for what I know will be a robust and terrific debate between two great legal minds, Professor John Harrison and Mr. Neil Kochel, on the question whether district courts have the authority to enter universal injunctions. Let me introduce them. Professor John Harrison is the James Madison Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law. He joined the faculty in 1993 as an associate professor of law after a distinguished career with the Department of Justice. His teaching subjects include constitutional history, federal courts, remedies, corporations, civil procedure, legislation, and property. In 2008, he was on leave from the law school to serve as counselor on international law in the office of the legal advisor at the US Department of State. A 1977 graduate of the University of Virginia, Professor Harrison earned his law degree in 1980 at Yale, where he served as editor of the Yale Law Journal and editor and articles editor of the Yale Studies in World Public Order. He was an associate at Patton Boggs and Blow in Washington, D.C., and clerked for Judge Robert Bork on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. He worked with the Department of Justice from 1983 to 93, serving in numerous capacities, including Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Office of Legal Counsel from 1990 to 1993. Uh, Neil Kochel, on my left, is a former acting Solicitor General of the United States and is now a partner at Hogan Lovell's U.S. LLP. Uh, focusing on appellate and complex litigation. He has extensive experience in matters of patent, constitutional, technology, securities, criminal, employment, and tribal law. In December 2017, American Lawyer Magazine named him the litigator of the year. He has already argued more Supreme Court cases, 37, than any other minority attorney in US history, recently breaking the record held by Justice Thurgood Marshall. Prior to joining Hogan Lovells, Neil served as Acting Solicitor General of the United States. In 2011, he received the highest award given to a civilian by the US Department of Justice, the Edmund Randolph Award. Earlier in his career, he served in the Deputy Attorney General's Office at the Justice Department as National Security Advisor and as Special Assistant to the Deputy Attorney General during 1998 to 99. Neil has also served as a law professor for over two decades at Georgetown University Law Center and has been a visiting professor at both Harvard and Yale Law Schools. After graduating from Yale Law School, Neil clerked for the Honorable Guido Calabresi of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, as well as for the Honorable Justice Stephen G. Breyer of the United States Supreme Court. I will also mention one last fun fact. Neil has played himself arguing a Supreme Court case against the Solicitor General in an episode of House of Cards on Netflix. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Which means you can find him not only in the Supreme Court Reporters, but also on IMDb.com. <laughs> Both John and Neil have given careful and sustained consideration to the question at hand. John, particularly through the lens of his academic work on the structural requirements in the Constitution, among other topics, and Neil most notably through his role as counsel of record for the respondents in Trump versus Hawaii, which presented the issue of the proper scope of relief at every level, including at the Supreme Court. I know they will both have a lot to say on this. Uh, the structure of this debate is that each will give an opening statement of about 12 minutes, followed by a second round of seven minutes each. Then we'll move into some back and forth discussion. Uh, Professor Harrison, please start us off. Thank you. I'm afraid I'm not to be found on Netflix, so this is a Federalist Society exclusive. <laughs> <laughs> I have three and a half things to say, and I will admit one of them is basically something I said at the very first Federalist Society event I participated in in 1986. And Grant Gilmore said of Christopher Columbus, Langdell, dean of the Harvard Law School, that he had one idea, and he clung to it with a tenacity of genius. <laughs> I will at least claim tenacity on this. <laughs> the first thing I will say is that it is intrinsic in the idea of a case, or case or controversy, but case is the broader co concept, so I'll use that one, under Article Three, that it is that the case is about the relation between parties and hence the remedial authority of the court extends only to vindicating the rights of the plaintiff. That's as far as it goes. That's one of those principles that is so basic that you are more likely to find traces or manifestations of it 
than straightforward statements of it, so I'll mention a couple of traces or manifestations of it. One, description of what a case is by John Marshall in Osborne against the Bank of the United States. That power, he said, referring to the judicial power, is capable of acting only when the subject is submitted to it by a party who asserts his rights in the form prescribed by law. That's what a case is. It's about the relationship between parties and remedies go to parties. Another manifestation of that is today's Supreme Court standing doctrine. There's a lot to criticize in the standing doctrine, but one of its fundamentals, I think, is well-founded. The reason private parties have to rely on private injury and can't rely simply on the fact that some law is not being complied with is because the right to demand compliance with the law just by itself belongs to another party. It belongs to the public, and parties can assert only their own rights, not those of others. Another manifestation of this, and I think this is especially interesting, because this is a place where, the, where you might find a manifestation of sort of what you might think of as the counter principle. I'm gonna find it in the Declaratory Judgment Act. And frequently, the Declaratory Judgment Act is sort of thought of as the source of the ability just to say, for example, that a statute is unconstitutional. The Declaratory Judgment Act, though, says that the courts may, in a declaratory judgment, in a case of actual controversy, declare the rights and other legal relations of any interested party. Legal relations, including rights, connect parties to one another. That relational idea of law, that relational idea in particular of litigation, was behind the Declaratory Judgment Act. It was well known to people at the time that, that act was being adopted, like, for example, Judge Cardozo in Paul's graph, who asked not, was there negligence, but was the Long Island Railroad create, had the Long Island Railroad created an unreasonable risk to Mrs. Paul's graph? Law and litigation are inherently relational. At least that's the way I see it. I'm a law professor. I like nice, clean concepts. History is a little messier than nice, clean concepts. And probably the most important reason to think that maybe the powers of the federal courts, the concept of the case, goes beyond just acting as to the party is equity practice back before the framing of the Constitution and, and ever since, in which equity courts sometimes gave and continue to give relief to parties who are not exactly before the court. And when I say not exactly, I want to stress that the primary manifestation of this in the old days in equity was what was called the Bill of Peace, in which one party or a number of parties could sue a wrongdoer who was doing something that affected a great many people and obtain relief that would benefit all the people involved. The important thing to understand about bills of peace is that they were understood as representative actions. That is to say, the reason one party or a limited number of parties could seek relief on behalf of others was because they stood in for those others. So the concept of a case does include representation. It does include some form of indirect litigation, but there has to be representation. And today, of course, the manifestation of that principle is the class action. Congress and the Supreme Court and the federal rules have prescribed the means by which one party can represent another. Those requirements are sometimes reasonably demanding, as they ought to be. To say that one party can say, I am here for someone else, is a major step when you understand the idea that lawsuits are relational. And so the limitations of the class action are there appropriately. That's point number one. Cases are about relations between parties. Remedies go to parties. Point two, this is the one that I said in 1986 and just can't get away from. It is often said that the reason it's OK to have universal or even, what's the next step, step up beyond universal? I guess it's cosmic. Cosmic, man. Um, <laughs> the justification for the trans-universal injunction is sometimes the idea that courts can, as it said, invalidate or strike down statutory rules or actions of the executive. That is a mistake. Courts decide cases. What I'm about to say is the, act, the logic of Marbury against Madison. Courts decide cases. Between parties give relief to parties. In order to decide cases, courts must identify the legal rules that apply. Because of the American legal hierarchy, they have to consider the possibility that lower level rules are invalid because they conflict with a higher level rule. It could be a statute conflicting with a constitution. It could be a regulation conflicting with a statute. That inquiry 
is, takes place before the court applies the law as it has identified the law to the parties and before it then gives any appropriate remedy. That is to say, this inquiry into the law is prior to what the court actually does, which acts on the rights and relations of the parties, not on the law in the abstract. And that is true, and it's especially important to see this, that is true even when the argument that is presented to the court is that some legal rule, some act of the executive is, as we say, facially invalid, is wholly invalid, is invalid in all of its applications. And I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk about this at the Rosencrantz debate because Nick Rosencrantz has done fundamental scholarship on just this point, elaborating the situations in which subconstitutional law is invalid at the level of a rule, which is frequently what the Constitution does. It makes whole rules invalid. But even when that's happening, what is still going on is the court is identifying the law at the step identified in Marbury prior to that of applying the law to the particular case, prior to the law of actually doing anything, and so striking down the law is a serious misnomer. There are a number of ways in which it's possible to get confused on this point. One that's of great practical importance is courts do not change law. They identify law and then they change the relations of parties. The Supreme Court of the United States in particular, functionally speaking, can do something that's a lot like changing the law because the Supreme Court sets precedents that govern the entire American judicial system. When the Supreme Court says that some law is unconstitutional at the level of a rule, it has done something a great deal like invalidating the law, but it has done something like invalidating the law. One of the things that law professors often debate, talking about the role of the courts, is how important are the law, what's called the law declaring function, the sort of thing I just described, and the case deciding function. My position, and by no means everyone holds this, but I certainly do so quite strongly, is that the law declaring function is based entirely on the case deciding function. And I will assert the same thing about the function of checking the other branches of government. Yes, the courts do that, but they do it by deciding cases and only by deciding cases. So my advice to the courts when they talk about their role in, in, in checking the other branches and striking down statutes and so forth is the first thing to know if you're going to be in the business of power is don't believe your own propaganda. <laughs> Rather, the appropriate way to understand what goes on in a constitutional case is, for example, United States against Eichmann, a case about the flag burning statute. The, con the Supreme Court concluded that that statute, following Nick Rosencrantz's logic, that they didn't know that yet, but that's what they were doing. <laughs> that that statute was wholly invalid. And then to apply it to that case, they said, and therefore, Eichmann can't be convicted. The actual case deciding part was about Eichmann. And the same thing would have been true, and this is the transition to point three. The same thing would have been true if instead of the case being United States against Eichmann, a criminal prosecution, it had been Eichmann against the attorney general, Eichmann against the enforcing officer. Suppose that Eichmann, the person who protests a lot, says, I plan to protest next week, but there's the flag burning statute. I want an injunction against the enforcement against me of the flag burning statute. The appropriate relief, given the facial invalidity of the statute, would have been an injunction as to prosecution against Eichmann. And that's the nice and simple situation. There are also more complicated situations, and they are genuinely interesting, and the Texas and Hawaii cases are examples of more complicated the situations. They present a, com a combination of two issues that can arise in equity. The first is what's sometimes called indivisible relief. An indivisible relief arises when there's something a defendant is doing that is wrongful as to more than one pot potential plaintiff. And where giving relief to one plaintiff necessarily means giving that relief to everybody else. For example, say one neighbor is making an excessive amount of noise and it constitutes a nuisance. Well, say the neighbor on the south side, the sort of person who says, hey, you kids, get off my lawn, sues and gets an injunction against the noise. That will have an effect on the neighbor on the north side, this is indivisible relief, even though the neighbor on the north side may really like the music and think this is saving me having to buy a sound system. That's indivisible relief, equity courts do it, it happens. My half point is, that may be what's happening when the DC Circuit, as they say, vacates entire regulations 
under the APA, the Hobbs Act. I'm just going to identify that, pass on from that, and continue with this. With the other complicating fashion, fa factor, one, indivisible relief, two, overbroad injunctions. That is to say, injunctions that are designed to get more than the conduct by the defendant that is unlawful, or more than the conduct by the defendant that harms the plaintiff, on the grounds that sorting out the various things the, the defendant is doing is too difficult. And the appropriate way to get relief for the plaintiff is to draw the overbroad injunction. That was, for example, what Texas asked for in the DACA case. Texas said DACA is wholly unlawful, and beneficiaries of DACA come to Texas and inflict costs on Texas. Hawaii said something quite similar in the Hawaii case. Now, not everybody who was a beneficiary of DACA was, in fact, going to go to Texas. Some people are so benighted that they never make it to Texas. <laughs> Similarly, not everyone who was kept out by the immigration orders were going to go to Hawaii. The argument was, can't tell them apart, give the overbroad relief, and the effect will be indivisible relief. That's how the two come together. When a court decides whether to grant overbroad relief, one of the things it considers is the extent of the burden on the defendant and whether it's justified. Because overbroad relief tells the defendant you can't do something that is not unlawful or at least not harmful to the plaintiff. The thing I want to add to that analysis, and courts have to do this when they're asked for this kind of relief, is to suggest they should also weigh against overbroad relief the interest of potential plaintiffs who have decided or may have decided not to sue. That's very much on display in the Texas DACA case, where a number of states of the union said, this program is lawful, and it benefits us. We think it is a good thing. Situations like that, that combine indivisible relief, where there are other potential plaintiffs, and the overbroad injunction, are situations where there's a very important interest, the interest in the potential plaintiff who doesn't want to sue, like the neighbor who likes the noise, that the, the equity courts should undertake to protect. And that's a situation in some of these cases, and I think the DACA case from Texas is an example, in which although geography isn't what this is mainly about, it's about universality, it's about cosmicness, maybe a geographical limitation would be one way to limit the overbroad injunction in the interest of the potential plaintiffs who did not want to sue. My larger point, and I wish I could say that I'm announcing a new maxim of equity, I don't think it's really that good, is that that interest of those other potential plaintiffs who don't want to sue, who may think this isn't a harm at all, is a very serious interest that the court should take it into account in creating what they understand to be overbroad injunctions. And uh, thinking about that, I'll just, I'll just close by saying here, Neil and I are working on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot to be said, of course, for just taking Saturday off. And one of the great things about the interest in not being a plaintiff is that it's an interest that can be exercised by doing nothing, by just taking the day off. That doesn't make it an unimportant interest. On the contrary, it's a very important interest. And to take it into account, give less indivisible relief than otherwise might be given, it seems to me to be good equity. Good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cacho. So first of all, it is just great to be here with all of you. Um, the Federalist Society is, I think, the only uh, organization whose invitation I accept every single year. Um, and I do so for one reason, which is its un unparalleled commitment to public debate. And um, hopefully what you see today is going to be part of that. But literally, I've come every year for over a decade now. Well, actually, I missed last year um, because I had an oral argument, but you probably didn't notice because Gene appointed an acting in my place. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, that temporary person is going to, you know, be here for at least a year. Um, but uh, uh, it's also great because this bears the name of my dear friend Nick Rosencrantz and colleague at Georgetown, so it's a particular privilege. So, I am here to defend the stalwart liberal, Jeffrey Sessions, who believed in nationwide injunctions until he didn't. He was for it until he was against it. And the argument is based on the text and structure in history of Article III, and, uh, as well as policy arguments. And you know what I'm going to do is defend what he did, which is 
Look, nationwide or cosmic injunctions aren't always appropriate. By no means, they should be rare. But in rare circumstances, they are permissible. And they should be rare. But the one question is, if you don't have them, what is the alternative? A litigant could only seek relief in the district court. The district court, what happens when that case goes to the circuit court? Will the circuit court announce a rule that only binds the party, not anyone else, so then everyone else has to bring a case? Uh, what happens when the case gets to the Supreme Court? And the fundamental thesis here is that if courts lose this rare tool that they use, they'll lose the significant ability to counter uh, things that, uh, that, actions by the other branches that incur on our individual rights and are inconsistent with limited government. And sometimes nationwide injunctions are the only way to police those things. So, you know, the, I think the story here starts actually with Hammer versus Dagenhart in, you know, 1918, 100 years ago, in which a group of corporations challenged that child uh, labor statute and the district judge held the law unconstitutional and issued an injunction, but that injunction did not apply just to the parties, it applied to everyone around. Um, and that, I think, is the first example that we've been able to find. I think Samuel Bray, in his article, was able to identify. And I think that that, 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 uh, that kind of way of thinking does follow from older practice. Um, I think the Supreme Court in the Grupo Mexicano case said, when you're thinking about the contours of the Article Three power, you look to what courts and equity did. And courts and equity, as Professor Harrison has just said, did provide relief in bills of peace. And the most important point about bills of peace is that they were not limited just to the parties before them. They extended more broadly. Now, Professor Harrison said yes, but those are representation cases. The litigant was always asserting his own rights. And he quoted the uh, Chief Justice Marshall's opinion in Osborne about litigants uh, asserting their own rights. Absolutely, I'm not defending the proposition that a litigant can come in without a claim and say, well, some other dude has a claim in some other jurisdiction and therefore I have standing to sue in a cause of action on the merits. Of course not. Uh, I'm defending the proposition in cases like Hawaii, which is that a litigant comes in and says, my rights are being violated and there should be an injunction uh, to prevent that deprivation of my rights. And by the way, others are facing the exact same problem and for unique reasons uh, in the particular case, like for immigration, it's because of Article One's commitment to uniformity, but there's other rationales for other cases. For those unique cases, a national inju nationwide injunction um, is appropriate. Now it is the case, um, as, uh, as uh, Assistant Attorney General Williams said, uh, that these are pretty rare things historically. And um, you know, um, I do think you know, that, is, uh, that is perhaps the best argument on the other side, which is this practice really starts in 1918, then 1963 takes off a little bit more. Um, but I think that there's a couple of points on the other side of that. Number one is, I think this organization knows better than anyone that there's a lot of federal laws out there now that didn't exist for a long period of time because of the expansive commerce power that the government has been asserting since the 1930s. And so it's not surprising that you would have more nationwide injunctions in a period in which the federal government is acting to do more uh, nationwide. Um, and so as the commerce power expands, so too, I think, does, uh, does the need for some sort of check and balance against that. And you know, those of you who believe in limited government who are concerned in particular about agency overreach, I think have the most to lose if Professor Harrison's uh, notion is adopted. And indeed, many of the injunctions since 1963, nationwide injunctions, including that one in 1963, was imposed not because of constitutional stuff, but because of administrative law. And so uh, the, you know, the text of the APA, I think, actually answers this question. It says that a court, quote, must hold unlawful and set aside, end quote, agency action that is unlawful. Set aside the agency action. Not, you know, just set it aside to that one party, but set it aside more generally. That's 706, section 706. And the DC Circuit has said, quote, when a reviewing court determines that agency regulations are unlawful, the ordinary result is that the rules are vacated, not just that their application to the individual petitioners is prescribed. And to me, that's really the heart of this debate, um, and certainly was in, in our 
uh, litigation of the Hawaii case. The idea that the uh, that the a that the agency here, the president of the agency, were stepping beyond their bounds, and those rules needed to be vacated. And it didn't make sense to just do it with respect to the parties at hand. Um, Professor Harrison referred to standing doctrine, but I think standing doctrine is very well accommodates for a long, long period of time the idea that these nationwide injunctions are permissible. Because after all, federal judges do issue nation or issue injunctions to prevent future injuries that are similar to those of the plaintiffs. Think about Hutto versus Finney, in which the court upheld a injunction that prohibited solitary confinement rules, um, even though uh, and it extended far beyond what the plant, what the individual uh, litigants were seeking because they needed a prophylactic protection against something broader. And in cases like NLRB versus Express Publishing Company, the federal courts enjoined defendants from engaging in conduct that could be anticipated to ha cause harm in the future. You all know the kind of capable of repetition yet evading review doctrine in which the individual so litigant is not suffering harm but nonetheless, the court says, I can extend relief beyond this individual plaintiff. Um, next friend standing, uh, another example. And then finally, something that Professor Harrison himself mentioned, the class action system. Because in the class action system, um, which is the bane of my existence these days, um, you have uh, all sorts of litigants who are an abs or all sorts of folks who are absent class members and getting a really functionally in a very similar position to non-parties who are benefiting from the relief that is being sought. Now, it's the case that sometimes the class action mechanism can do the work of a nationwide injunction. And for that reason, and you know, to the extent we have any sort of Professor Harrison balancing thing, and I think we're in agreement that, you know, that there should be weighing by the court as to whether a nationwide injunction is really necessary. If the class action system is able to do it, then absolutely it strikes me that that's the appropriate thing. But sometimes a class action system isn't going to work the right way. Think about, for example, something that is very fast moving. Think about version one of the travel ban in which on Friday night, the thing is announced. You have chaos at the airports, not just in this country, but worldwide. Um, it would have made no sense, it seems to me, for someone to come in and say, win their case, and then to say, well, you've only won it for you, individual person, every other person has to sue now. Um, that's the most enormous waste of resources imaginable and I think would fall disproportionately and benefit only certain people and not others. Indeed, we had an example of this in which the judge in Massachusetts enjoined it for only for people coming to Logan Airport um, and the chaos that resulted as a result of that as individuals abroad started to switch their flights to Logan Airport and the like, um, it just doesn't strike me as a smart way to run a system. And that's particularly so, again, in those rare cases when you do have a constitutional command and sometimes a statutory command for uniformity, as you did in the travel ban case. Obviously, Article One requiring a uniform rule of naturalization, uh, as well as the 1986 immigration law, which also calls for, you know, it says, quote, the immigration laws of the United States should be enforced vigorously and uniformly. Other times you have circumstances in which the harm that the plaintiff is seeking to remedy spills out beyond the jurisdiction of, a, of, the, of the individual court, the individual district court. And there it seems to me non-controversial that you should have an injunction uh, that extends beyond the geographic contours of the uh, particular district court. Um, so I think maybe I'll stop there and just answer, or, or actually raise one thing that Professor Harrison didn't uh, mention, but I do think is a, a pretty important counter argument to everything I've said, which is percolation. Um, and the argument goes like this. If you have a nationwide injunction, that freezes the litigation landscape. And so the federal government can't come in and really get that litigated in another circuit or something like that. And the rules about collateral estoppel and stuff, the Supreme Court has said, really the federal government should have the opportunity to litigate in other circuits. And, and I do think that that is a problem. And one reason why I think nationwide injunctions should be rare. And, and by the way, I, you know, I agree um, with uh, Assistant Attorney General Williams that, you know, that they've gone up uh, to 20 or 27 um, in the Trump administration. I think that says a lot more about the president than it does about the courts. Um, but um, 
Uh, but I do think that that is a problem, this idea of uh, percolation. I do think that there's, you know, oftentimes there are ways to still get those cases to percolate, the travel ban being a good example in which litigation did ensue in multiple circuits despite the nationwide injunction nature of this. But, but here's where I'll close. Um, I think that you know when I when I ran the Solicitor General's office and we faced nationwide injunctions, we had a pretty easy remedy for that, which was to go to the Supreme Court and get that injunction vacated. And they did so on motions, you know, and they certainly have done so in, in this administration as well. That strikes me as a tried and true path um, to creating the type of percolation that I think all of us want to see in appropriate cases. And then sometimes it won't be appropriate and the injunction will remain um, in place. But to me, that's the better solution. And for, you know, given all of your jubilation about where the court is right now, the Supreme Court, um, it seems to me actually conservatives have more to lose if Professor Harrison's view is adopted um, because you actually do have the ability to get percolation and get uh, these nationwide, injunction, nationwide injunctions lifted, perhaps at a higher frequency rate than might a Democratic president. At least so the argument would go. We'll have to see, but at least that's something that I think we should put on the table. Okay. Thank you. Professor Harrison, you now have four and a half minutes. Okay, to I used up some of my time. I have three half points, the, the and one, one real point. The first, the first half point is just to stress there are situations in, in which relief is, is indivisible, and under those circumstances, the other potential plaintiffs are just going to have to get the benefit whether they think of it as a benefit or not, but striking down a statute, for example, or a regulation not an example of inherently indivisible relief, or at least, not, at least not statutes. Second point, just a point of clarification, we talked about this a couple of times. Geography is secondary. The nationwide or not nature of the injunctions is, is not really the issue. A plaintiff may move around and the defendant may affect the plaintiff all over the place, and so geographically broad injunctions may be just fine. The point about the, the, point about the APA, and in particular the DC Circuit's practice of, as they say, vacating orders, vacating regulations, rests on a particular reading of the APA and a couple of other statutes, like the Hobbs Act. I, I, one of my projects, uh, when I'm not taking a day off, is going to be to try to track that down and decide whether I think that's right or not as a matter of reading the statutes. If it is right, I think it's an example of a situation in which Congress has provided a form of relief that is indivisible. If the order is vacated, it's vacated as to everybody by way of giving relief to this particular, to this particular party. Again, indivisible relief is going to happen. Now the large, the large point. I didn't talk about percolation. I didn't talk about forum shopping. I didn't talk about functional considerations because when it comes to these fundamental questions about the structure of government, I don't care about for, per, percolation or forum shopping, or any of these other functional considerations. And not everybody is going to be with me on that. And not everybody on this room is going to be with me on that. Because my claim is a fairly radical one, which is, but I will stand by it, which is that it is a condition on the legal legitimacy of what the courts do, that they operate within the confines of a structure of government that does, does not have a council of revision, does not have a European style Chalcedonian court, does not have institutions that can operate directly on the content of the law, has instead common law style courts that decide cases before them. And they have pluses and minuses when it comes to checking the government. And I urge that the minuses be accepted along with the pluses. The methodological point about that, about how to understand laws and how to understand the Constitution, I think is to what extent should provisions like Article III itself and the whole structure of the way the courts work be understood in light of a purpose attributed to them, say the purpose of reining in the executive and the purpose may require adaptation to change over time like the expansion in the state, and to what extent should they be understood as being rule-like? And I will say my fundamental commitment on this issue and issues like this is it is always necessary to ask first whether an enactment is a rule. 
That is to say, something that is to be interpreted formalistically and simply by applying it without asking whether it is fully implementing its purpose. If it is a rule, then you live with its limitations, and it seems to me that these basic features of the system, and in particular, the role of the courts, as elaborated in Marbury, is a rule. Now, Mr. Kochel, seven minutes. Okay, great. I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll take the seven minutes, um, because, uh, but I, I will say a couple of things. Um, number one, I, I'm glad Professor Harrison admits this is a radical um, approach. Um, uh, it is. Um, and, you know, uh, the idea that we would rein the courts in from this really important tool um, that uh, I think is, particularly in an age of expansive federal government, is, I think, a very dangerous uh, proposition. Um, I actually think that, you know, as, part, as we think about the originalist conception of the document, we have to think about how would the founders have reacted to an expansive Congress and an expansive executive that strayed far beyond what they in initially envisioned. And would it be that they would have really said, oh, but courts, you have to stay in your lane exactly where you are. Now, I actually think that Nationwide injunctions do follow from the way in which court, the lane in which courts operated, like bills of peace. They did expand beyond their, the relief given to the individual parties and expanded brought more broadly. And since 1918, as I said, we've had federal courts um, doing this. Now, Professor Harrison says, well, but sometimes relief is indivisible. And for the, in those circumstances, a nationwide injunction would be appropriate, but not in others. Um, but I don't think federal courts have limited them for 100 years. Um, and I think it would be a very dangerous proposition to do so for limited government um, reasons. And that is why federal courts don't do what Professor Harrison is doing, not just in the nationwide injunction area, but in all sorts of other areas of standing law, like uh, the prophylactic rules they set, like capable of repetition, yet evading review and the like. And so if you adopt this view, you're really adopting a set of views about federal courts that is deeply, deeply stunted and one that I think is very much in tension with the goal of most people in this room and our founders, which was um, limited government. The final thing I'll say is about the APA. Um, uh, I happen to be a plain text kind of guy when it comes to statutory interpretation. The text is as plain as day that this is what federal courts are empowered to do, set aside agency action more broadly, invalidated as a whole, when an individual litigant comes before. And so that relief extends more broadly. Now, Professor Harrison is right to say this is authorized by Congress. And so maybe that makes it different. But the big debate over nationwide injunctions happens to be largely around APA cases. And so at least for, I don't know the exact numbers, but of that 27, list of 27, many of those are APA cases. Um, so, uh, you know, don't think of the overall number count when you think about um, whether this is legitimate or not. And then the last thing I'd say is, you know, the fact that Congress has provided it here in the APA context doesn't mean that they have to do so elsewhere, some sort of exclusio unias principle or something like that. It very well may be an example of the power that federal courts have historically had in this realm. So thanks. It's been a pleasure uh, debating with you. So now we'll have some more general give and take, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, one question I had for you, Professor Harrison, is, is Mr. Kochel right that the better originalist argument is for courts to have this power, that the, the founders would have wanted a greater check on government action and not to have the, that the, it should lean against government action rather than allowing it to go forward? Well, I, the, the word originalist is, of course, a dangerous one. Mm -hmm. And one reason and one reason You're telling two. me. <laughs> <laughs> and, one reason, uh, and one reason it's dangerous is because it frequently leads to the kind of inquiry that I think Neil's in favor of and that I'm against, which is what are the purposes and how would people who had these purposes have wanted the structure to adapt to changing situations. And I think it, first, I think it is, it, is extreme, it is extremely difficult to answer questions like that 
And one reason I'm not that kind of originalist, to the extent I'm an originalist, is because I think it is extremely answer, difficult to answer questions of the form, okay, had they known all these things that have happened in the succeeding 200 years, how would those particular people have thought about this? Well, they wouldn't be those particular people anymore if they knew the, the, next, the next 200 years of history. I, I, do, I do think that the rule structure that they gave us operates the way I described it, and it does have a place for things like bills of peace, but that those have to be representative actions, and again, that's implemented through, cl through, class, through class actions. And yes, if the, if the federal convention reconvened in 2019, what would they do? I don't know. I do know, if, I, I think it would be an excellent idea to have a new federal convention now, but it would be run by us and not by the people from the 18th century. So Mr. Kacha, why aren't class actions sufficient? Um, you know, Rule 23 is there for a reason. It provides pr protection. It provides a lot of um, requirements, as you know, to certify a class. It, aren't those protections there for a reason? And aren't you subverting them if you're not using the class action in only unique cases? Yeah, so first let me just say a word about method. Um, and, um, you know, I think, Professor Harrison's right to say it's difficult to understand and ask the question, answer the question, what would the founders have thought about X in today's age? Um, but I think as my colleague Randy Barnett has pointed out, oh, Randy's right there, um, uh, it, it's also hard to ask the questions that we're dealing with on a sub-constitutional level. You know, is founding practice about bills of equity the same as what nationwide injunctions are? You have these, you know, deep, translation questions, both in, not just in constitutional law, but all throughout the law. I'm not sure necessarily that they're any more difficult in one um, than the other. Now, with respect to class actions, look, I think th these are nationwide injunctions when imposed in the rare circumstances, like the travel ban, are effectively representation actions. So they follow directly from the tradition of the bills of peace. And oftentimes they can be used and should be used. And indeed, when a court is thinking about, is this the rare circumstance in which a nationwide injunction is appropriate? I think you're absolutely right. They have to ask as one of their very first questions, why isn't this a class action? But in a case like the travel ban, the reason would be twofold. Number one, fast moving emergency situation in which it would be kind of impractical and, um, and uh, very hard to actually certify a class within the time period necessary in order to give relief to the parties. Literally, plane tickets are bought and people are at the airport. And you have a constitutional command that says that immigration law has to be done uniformly. So in a circumstance like that, it's actually, to me, in tension with the Constitution and the original understanding of it to allow a court to do something and slice and dice up what immigration law would look like. So uh, Professor Harrison, is Mr. Kochel right? He's, he's raised several times the APA and the set-aside language. Do you think that's a, a correct reading of the APA that Congress intended for set-aside to extend beyond the parties and that that should, by, virtue, by extension, apply beyond the APA? Two things. First, as I said, I'm not sure. And one of the, one of the, one of the reasons I'm not sure, and people have, people have written this, uh, about this a little bit in this, in this connection, is the APA and the remedial structure that it created was, at the time it was adopted, largely aimed at adjudications. Rulemaking was substantially less common than that it is now. And exactly how the different provisions of the APA and, the sim and, and, and similar statutes operate with respect to rules, I think is a question that has to be answered. Some of those words certainly sound like set aside, that's something, an that's something a court does with the award of an arbitrator, for example. That sounds like it's adjudicatory, and that's the sort of the body of questions I would want to look at that I just don't know the answers to. Mm -hmm. the, other, the, other th the other thing I will say about the APA is that if it, if, it, if it means that, then it is a congressionally mandated form of indivisible relief which operates on an entire administrative, an administrative decision. Essentially what the court is doing is ordering the agency to rescind the entire act that it, that it undertook. Indivisible, indivisible relief is not intrinsically unconstitutional. If Congress decides they want it, they can have it. The, the thing I will say is, is, is that 
where relief is necessarily divisible, then it goes beyond the authority of the courts to grant it to somebody who's not appointed. So, uh, Mr. Kacha, how do you respond to concerns that universal injunctions are a, a one-way ratchet? So for the government, uh, the ACLU brings 10 cases in forums that it likes, and uh, the government has to win in every single case in order to prevail, but the ACLU has to only uh, win in one case, for yeah. example. Um, great. So, and before doing that, just, just on the text of the API, I mean, literally, this is the plain text that they, quote, hold unlawful and set aside agency action. Action. It doesn't say courts are empowered to set aside agency adjudications. And obviously, the whole structure of the APA is agencies do two things. They make rules and they adjudicate cases. And obviously, both are encompassed within the term agency action, just on the plain text. Look, the one-way ratchet is, I, I think, a problem. It's the kind of doppelganger of the, uh, of the percolation problem. Um, and it does impose extra burdens on the federal government, as you know, I certainly know well. Um, at the same time, I think that's actually the burden the federal government should have. Um, again, not in every case. I think these should be done really rarely. But when you have a federal government that is so powerful, that is so capable of taking away people's rights, I think you know, they should at least temporarily have to run the table. They can always go to the Supreme Court and, or to the Court of Appeals first to try and get the injunction um, lifted. Um, but, um, but ultimately, it strikes me as that's the right way to do it. And again, these emergency cases are ones where there's a constitutional command for uniformity or something like that. So what about this argument that you can always go to the Supreme Court? Is that sufficient to say, well, the government can just ask for relief from a nationwide injunction if they go to the Supreme Court? Well, again, that's a, that's a functional consideration. And so in, in commenting on it, I'm, I'm sort of, uh, I, this, this is gravy for, um, for I'm, I'm, I'm going beyond what I primarily want to, want to say. But the, the, ans the answer is not necessarily. That is one remedy, but the Supreme Court has a lot going on. So it's, not, it's certainly not unheard of for them to have more than, for the Supreme Court to have more than one emergency, the situation before it, and to say, Oh yeah, any, any, t any time there's a real problem with a fire in this, in this town, we can just dynamite all the buildings right around where the fire is. Yes, there are, there are solutions, but that's a, a costly and frequently, as a, fu as a functional matter, a costly and I think often an unnecessary a solution. That kind, of, that kind of burden shouldn't be put on a single institution that, that uh, has a lot going on. So the proposition, though, is not any time there's a fire. It's every any time that there's a rare fire. <laughs> a rare fire. <laughs> All right. We now have 15 minutes, so we'll open it up to questions. And I saw Professor Calabrese up first, so go ahead. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, my question is primarily for Professor Harrison, but also for Professor Katyal. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the history of injunctive relief and to do that, I wanted to mention something about English courts as well as the American history of injunctive relief. Uh, in England, from the 12th century until 1492, there were th three common law courts, the Court of King's Bench, the Court of Common Pleas, and the Court of Exchequer. Of those courts, only the Court of King's Bench could issue writs of mandamus. When Henry VII became king in 1492, he created three equity courts, the Court of Star Chamber, the Court of High Commission, which heard ecclesiastical cases, and the Court of Chancery, which heard ordinary equitable cases. In 1641, the Court of Star Chamber was abolished because it had been abusive. The Court of High Commission was also abolished. The only equity court surviving when the framers wrote the Constitution in 1787 was the Court of Chancery, and that was the only court you could get an injunction from. To get a writ of mandamus in England, you had to go to the Court of King's Bench. In 1837 or so, the US Supreme Court decided Kendall against Stokes at Rel uh, et al. And in that case, Congress had by statute prescribed that a certain number of mail carriers be paid by Amos Kendall who was the postmaster general to Andrew Jackson, a sum of money which they claimed they were due. Kendall refused to pay the money. The, the Stokes, at, on behalf of the people, went to the court and sought a writ of mandamus from the lower court. 
the court issued the writ of mandamus, and then in the Supreme Court, the issue was, do all the federal courts in the country have the power to issue writs of mandamus and injunctions, or is this a special power which could only be exercised by the Court of King's Bench in England, which could only be exercised by a federal court of chancery? And the court found that all the courts in the country were courts of equity, and all the courts in the country could issue injunctions and writs of mandamus. That takes us up to the Lochner period. And after Lochner, progressives became very concerned about court injunctions because they were often used to break strikes. So the progressives established what was called a three-judge district court. And only three-judge district courts could adopt injunctions. And this was to prevent the abuse of injunctions, which the progressives thought the Lochner era judges were engaging in. In 1975, the post-Watergate Congress repealed that act because they wanted single district judges to enjoin civil rights violations, and they wanted to make it easier to get injunctions. So today, three judge district courts only remain for voting rights cases. If you have a single judge able to issue an injunction, not only can that apply nationwide, but it also means that a single district judge in California can stop the governor and the state legislature of California from doing something that they want to do. Shouldn't we go back to the system of having three judge courts to issue injunctions, the system that we had from the Lochner era up until the, the Democrats repealed it for civil rights reasons in the 1970s? You know, equity is good and a court of chancery is good and writs of mandamus and injunctions have their place. But the broad history of both English and American law is that mostly uh, that power has been limited in some way or another, and the nationwide injunctions being issued right now are not limitations of that kind. Yeah, I when I when I started when I started thinking about this, one of the things I thought about was whether to suggest something like that, alleged alleged because. There's legislation been introduced in, in Congress specific, specifically about this problem. And one of the questions is a reform like that retur returning to the days of the, of the three judge district court. And the, re the, the reason I didn't say anything about that is because I genuinely don't know what I think about that as an administrative reform. There is, there is, so there is something to be said for it. This kind of relief, and again, it's, I think it's the important part is not the nationwide character it's the as to all potential plaintiffs character. That's the, that's the, that's the real issue here. There is, there is something to be said for that, but the country's experience with three judge district courts has not altogether been happy, in part because whenever there's a rule about a three judge having three judge district courts, those rules have to be administered and those rules further complicate the litigation. Back when there were three judge district courts, there would be long preliminary debates about whether this really should go to the three judge district court. Sometimes part of a case went to one judge and the other part went to a three judge court. And, and that's another reason that Congress got rid of that system. And so without giving the matter substantially more thought, I wouldn't say anything other than that's an option that should be on the, on the, on the, on the agenda but we have to bear in mind, there's a body of experience that shows that it has pluses and minuses. And just to add to that, there's a real practical problem. I've, I've litigated in three judge courts, for example, in voting rights cases in mm -hmm. which that still exists. Um, I'm not sure the law still exists anymore, but, uh, but uh, the, the three judge courts, uh, the problem with that is when you have a three judge court, it goes directly to the Supreme Court. There's actually only two levels there, not three. Right. And for those of you who are concerned about nationwide injunctions, actually it might be better, the current system, because right now it's district court, then it immediately goes to the circuit court within seconds, basically. The district courts ask to stay their injunction if they deny. Then you, the Solicitor General just authorizes an appeal pretty much on a rocket docket, and within a few hours, that appeal arrives at the circuit court. So better, it seems to me, to have actually four lower court judges, which is the current system, deciding this, a district court judge, and then three court of appeals judges, than to only have three. One could have three judge district courts with an appeal going to the court of appeals and then to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. All of this would require new legislation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. Is that Professor Barnett? Yes, um, believe it or not, Steve Calabrese asked the exact same question I was going to ask. Yeah. 
I have never heard Randy so quiet. <laughs> I, I think maybe it goes to that side before it comes back oh, to me, or, okay. or, or, or with, it's, it's up to you to decide. Uh, sure, well, go ahead. I think you were maybe the issue of who should go should go to a, a three-judge district yeah, court, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> but until we convene, see how long it takes. Until we convene such a court, I'll, I will go ahead and ask my question, which is primarily for John Harrison, but uh, Neil Katz, I'll certainly welcome to comment as well. Uh, and that is, if I understand your argument correctly, and if I don't, certainly tell me why I don't, uh, it's actually fine to have, or was fine to have a wide range of uh, nationwide injunctions or universal injunctions during the period when you could have the bills of peace, but now that's been displaced by uh, class actions, and class actions are the only mechanisms. So that, I think, raises an issue or two. One is, is it really the case the class actions have displaced bills of peace, or maybe they've uh, given an alternative mechanism by which you can get nationwide injunctions, but also get a number of other things which are unique to class actions. And the other is that if it is the case, as, as you suggest, that the, the bills of peace injunctions were permissible because they were representational, but, rep, but being representational doesn't require any actual agreement by these other parties that they're that, that the party before the court will represent their interests uh, 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 and, and so forth, then it seems like a pretty thin notion of what's representational that would also, again, allow a pretty wide range of universal injunction cases, probably, I think, in nearly all the situations where Neil Katyal would want them to exist, that is, cases where there is a broad-ranging policy with many potential plaintiffs who are similarly situated. So if that is the case, uh, it seems like maybe your argument ultimately weeds in a direction that's much closer to your opponents than, uh, than may seem at first sight. Yeah, here's what, here's what I think about bills of peace based, based on my current knowledge of that, and there's always more to know about <laughs> historical things like this, that they were, they were understood as being genuinely representational, that the courts would conduct at least some inquiry into the commonality of interest of the, of the plaintiffs who were not present. So it seems, to, it seems to me, first point, is that requirement that there be genuine representation is meaningful, and it was, it was understood to be meaningful then, it should be understood to be meaningful now, insofar as this is part of Article Three. And the other thing I want to say is, yes, I do think, uh, class actions have other functions, but I do think they have in effect, they have displaced anything other than the class action that would operate on the, on the justification that it is representative. What Congress and the court have done is say, yes, it's possible to have a representative action, and this is what it looks like. It is a class action. So they have occupied all of that space, and they've occupied other space too, but they've occupied all of the space with the class action. One, one, of, the, one of the good things about having the class action, I think, is I'll admit, the, the concept of a representative action as we can discern it in history, as I say, I think it's meaningful. It is a somewhat amorphous idea, just how much, how representative does it have to be, just how much do the interests of the absent plaintiffs have to be, have to be consulted. One good thing, you know, I believe in rules, one good thing about the class action mechanism is that it takes that relatively amorphous concept and makes it significantly more, more specific and in, requires particular inquiries into, well, what are the circumstances under which one party can genuinely be said to represent another? Um, I guess I'd say two things. Number one is uh, that, uh, you know, Professor Harrison says that that was a genuine, that he thinks that under the bills of peace, there was a true inquiry into the representational nature. I'm not sure of that, but I've read a little bit about this. I understand there was an inquiry into whether others are similarly situated um, in the bills of peace, um, but that seems to me very similar to what happens in these nationwide injunctions too, in those rare circumstances in which they should be imposed. It seems to me one of the questions is, is that necessary? Is there some group of people at airports around the world or something that can't effectively get relief in one place or another? And the second thing I'd say is, I do think you know, your question really does underscore one of the tensions in this argument. Oh, we can just use class actions. We don't need nationwide injunctions. Class actions have many of the same problems, I know Professor Harrison isn't as focused on that, but others are, percolation, asymmetric effects to the government. I mean, if I win a class action injunction in district court, I mean, I only need to win one in any particular jurisdiction, and then nationwide, that, you know, the government is, uh, 
government's hands are tied and there won't be percolation in other circuits absent a lifting of the injunction by the United States Supreme Court on emergency relief. So it seems to me the class action has the same kind of uh, policy problems that do nationwide injunctions. Over here. Uh, two short questions. First, if Professor Katchel's right about the meaning of the APA, doesn't that make universal injunctions mandatory in every single case, challenging agency rules or agency actions? And then doesn't that in turn undercut your claim that universal injunctions should be rare? Second, why can't courts presume that agency rules are severable? as applied to every discrete litigant and every discrete circumstance. Normally courts presume that statutes are severable in that way, uh, unless it's an abortion case. So <laughs> why, shouldn't, why shouldn't the same presumption carry over to agency rules? And if your argument seems to presume agency rules should be regarded as non-severable, but I think that presumption needs to be justified and, and not simply assumed. So uh, I don't think they can be severable just because of the text of the APA. Sometimes, you know, you have a severability clause or something like that. Here you really do have 706 saying, quote, the reviewing court shall hold unlawful and set aside agency action found to be in excess of jurisdiction or contravening a constitutional right or whatever. Um, that's a very good point that I do think that, you know, if you can prove up to a court that the agency action is unlawful, then it would follow from the text of the statute that it has to be set aside. Let, let me add one, th one, thing about, one thing about that. Whatever you think about severability in, in some other possible context, some APA challenges, like for example, a failure to go through notice and comment, are the kind of thing that operate at the level of the rule. So I, my question is for Mr. Kata. Um, and it basically it is, is your version of percolation really percolation? Um, it seems to me that you have exactly the same problem that you've identified in many other circumstances where agencies, including such things as the IRS, may get a, a, uh, an opinion they don't like in one particular circuit or district court, and they will accede to it in just that place. And not a, but they also have to make a decision. Do we accede to it in just that place or nationwide? And that becomes, therefore, a, uh, an administrative decision. So your version of this puts the, uh, the court in charge of deciding whether it's going to be nationwide and takes it away from the administration, number one. And number two, I always thought that the uh, whole policy argument about percolation was to give the Supreme Court a more developed um, view of what was going on. Is it really percolation to leave it up to one court to decide and, and give only one judges or perhaps another version that you suggested is the district court and the circuit court for that particular area to have it developed only to that degree and not allow the Supreme Court to have the same issue developed uh, more thoroughly and have a more thoroughly developed record before so f at least those two aspects is your version of percolation really percolation? Right, okay, so I, I might not have been, I might have used too much shorthand and might not have been clear enough as to what I'm saying. So first of all, I think percolation is a big problem with nationwide injunctions. Second, I think that when the, the Supreme Court Avenue I'm talking about is a way to let a thousand flowers bloom. So the way it works is say, I don't know, the Ninth Circuit enjoins something um, uh, that the president is doing. Um, then, the, then you can meet where the district court in the Ninth Circuit, and then it goes to the Ninth Circuit. They say, yeah, that's absolutely fine over a dissent, uh, but it goes, uh, uh, it go, uh, it, uh, then the Solicitor General has the option of going right to the Supreme Court and saying, please dissolve this injunction. If they dissolve the injunction, it's not like it's just now the Ninth Circuit is the only ball game. It now means that, in, that action will go into effect everywhere else because the government believes what they're doing is lawful. And so they will seek to enforce it in all the other circuits. Litigation, the 10 ACLU lawsuits will then be brought in all of those other circuits. And then you will have percolation through that mechanism. And so you have effectively a blank slate for the courts of appeals on which to rule and to tee up a case then for 
the uh, United States Supreme Court. And look, I don't think this is ideal in any circumstance, in, in almost any circumstance, but there are those rare circumstances when it is effectively the second best option because otherwise you are dealing with the immediate deprivation of rights from people who otherwise can't sue, who can't get their rights protected through the class action mechanism, and it may contravene a constitutional command like uniformity. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, first question is, uh, should it be, I'm not like Mr. Calabrese, I'm not that knowledgeable, but if, is, I think there's a reasonable concern about having a district court judge from really anywhere uh, constrain the president of the United States. And so one of my things is, do you think it would be prudent that uh, an appeal has to be found and won at the Supreme Court level before the executive of the United States is constrained, number one. And number two, shouldn't we be considering this uh, as not only negative injunctions, but also affirmative injunctions? Imagine if a district judge has an affirmative injunction that applies to everybody across the board. Um, and how does this impact the equation? I think it's reasonable to consider that. And if you could, I'd appreciate it. So uh, any such notion of an affirmative injunction just seems to me ridiculous on its own terms. That's not a problem with nationwide injunctions. That's a problem with the injunction itself. And any court that deigned to impose such a thing as you're suggesting, it would be the easiest thing in the world for any solicitor general to get that lifted by the Court of Appeals. So that strikes me as a non-problem. Now look, you could say the Supreme Court is the only one that can effectively carry out its relief um, when there's unconstitutional, unlawful action being taken. There's a couple problems with that. One, it would contravene the text of the APA, but number two, I think it would really contravene our constitutional structure. Um, I mean, presidents can do all sorts of indelible, dangerous, anti-constitutional, unconstitutional things, and it takes a while to get a case up to the Supreme Court. So that strikes me, again, from the principle of so many of you in this room, a principle rooted in limited government, a very dangerous thing to just say you've got to get all the way up to the Supreme Court before your relief has any purchase. I, 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 I largely agree with that. Everything I said about running three judge district courts like this, I guess, multiplied at least by three or maybe cubed if it's the Supreme Court of the United States where, they have, where there are nine of them and they're known to have strong views about issues. And the, the actual original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is by design quite narrow. There's a reason we have this entire the federal judicial system. So considering, considering that as sort of a, a policy suggestion, I, I have doubts about three judge district courts. And I think one point on which we disagree, the, the less the Supreme Court of the United States is called on in these situations, I think as a, as a policy matter, the better for the country. Well, thank you so much. We, I know Professor, uh, Mr. Kajal has a hard stop at 2.15, so we're going to end a little early. But thank you so much to both of you for being here, for giving your thoughts. This is a really live issue in the courts, so it'll be interesting to watch it over this term and over the next couple of terms. Thank you. Thank you.